Who? Well, good uh, afternoon for those of you who are in the States. For those of you that are in Europe, good evening. For those of you that are in Asia, well, good middle of the night, wherever that might be. Uh, I know we've got people watching from all over the world. Uh, I see you've got people here from New Zealand, from London, from Afghanistan, from uh, Kenya, from Uganda, from South Africa. I want to welcome you all here. Normally, I would be doing a study on Saturday and broadcasting live. However, because the spring feasts of the Lord from Leviticus 23 are upon us and start in about uh, two and a half weeks, I've decided I need to give you an introduction to the feasts of the Lord and to the spring feasts. Now, this is actually a six-segment teaching. Actually, it's a seven. I already taught the first segment on the first fall feast uh, two weeks ago. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. And if you don't have a link, if you're watching, you probably do have a link. But if you don't have a link, just go to YouTube and search for Rose of Sharon, comma, MN. And you will find that I have 14 or 16 videos up there. All of the fall feasts are already up, and I've been uh, and I've been uploading videos as I've been teaching. Although I've been doing this for 20 years, but only with the uh, with the uh, invention or the improvement in technology are we able to do this on a regular basis. Now, most of the videos that are up on my YouTube channel have not been edited for uh, in order to put. Uh, handouts or screenshots or charts on there. I will eventually get to that, but unfortunately, my Adobe suite is so old it won't run on my Windows 10 computers. And speaking of Windows 10 computer, my computer that I'm using here uh, for my uh, scripture that I'm going to be reading, uh, unfortunately, it just decided that it needed to install the latest version of Windows 10, and I'm hoping that it's not going to want to restart in the middle of this presentation. Now, this lesson is called An Introduction to the Spring Feast. And of course, my name is Michael Rose, and my ministry is Rose of Sharon Ministries of Minnesota. That is the main ministry, although I do run four uh, other ministries. One of them is, uh, is a teaching ministry just like this, except it uh, uses a different name. At any rate, let me start by telling you this. All biblical feasts occur according to the lunar calendar. Now, we're all on solar calendars nowadays, but in ancient times, all calendars were either lunar calendars or uh, observational cal calendars. And the old, uh, the original Hebrew calendar or Jewish calendar, if you want to put it that way, Although it's gone through a number of change, and I do have a, an extensive teaching on the on the calendars and the ancient calendars, not going to cover that today. Uh, the original calendar, uh, very ancient, was uh, I started in the springtime, but it was also partially observation, and it is also today. Now, as I have just said, all ancient calendars started in the springtime, and that's usually late March or early April uh, on our modern calendars. Now, there are five biblical feasts that I'm going to address today. One I've already taught on extensively, and go to my YouTube channel, and you will find it there. It's the first spring feast, Purim, and it's on the, as I said, on my uh, YouTube channel. Four of these feasts are called Feasts of the Lord, and these four feasts, as I mentioned earlier, are all found in Leviticus 23, and then, of course, the one that already happened two weeks ago, uh, or actually a week and a half ago, the Feast of Purim, that's found in the Book of Esther. Now, the fall feast, uh, the, excuse me, the first spring feast actually falls, the Feast of Purim, on the 13th day in the Hebrew calendar, which is the month of Adar. I'm just going to briefly talk about it because I didn't talk about this when I, on that video. And it, as I said, it's the Feast of Purim, and it's found in the book of Hadassah, which is the Hebrew name 
for Esther. Esther is a Purim name. It's found in chapter 9 of the book of Esther, verses 26 through 28. Now, I want to note, however, for those of you that will be watching this in future years, or if you're watching some of my older videos that I will eventually put up, in the Hebrew leap year, this occurs on the, on Adar the second because the Hebrew calendar, unlike the, uh, the Gregorian calendar, adds an entire month. And it does vary depending on, uh, it's, it's fairly regular, but it does, uh, it does vary depending on the uh, agricultural harvest. Now, the Feast of Esther uh, has end time significance as Haman, uh, the villain in it, is an Agagite, and he's also an Amalekite, uh, who the Lord has told us he is going to battle with from generation to generation. And that's found in Exodus 17, verses 14 through 16. Now I'm going to move on to the spring feast of the Lord. Because the next four feasts are the appointed seasons of the Lord. And this is found in Leviticus 23, verse 2. I'm skipping the weekly feast, which is in verse 1. And it reads, and I'm using the Jewish Publication Society of 1917, it's one of my more favorite Bibles, uh, that and the Lisa 1853, because those two Bibles are translated directly from the Hebrew Masoretic text. The Masoretes put vowels into the Hebrew language so that people uh, other than, than uh, rabbinically trained people, rabbis, uh, didn't actually read or speak Hebrew, so, so the common folk could actually learn it. And so... It translates the Hebrew language directly into, well, King James English. I mean, it's, let's face it, it's the 19th and the very early, earliest part of the 20th century. But it reads this way. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The appointed seasons of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my appointed seasons. Now, regardless of which version of the Bible that you use, Every single one of them delivers the exact same message, although the language might be slightly different. It says they are either appointed seasons of the Lord, or some of them say it's feasts of the Lord. Some of them say it's my appointed feast, and other versions of the Bible say these are my appointed festivals. They all mean exactly the same thing. Now, this is so important that Moses, according to God's instructions, repeated it a second time, two verses later, in verse 2 of Leviticus 23. And it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye are my, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. This is the King James Version that I just quoted. Now, every version of the Bible says, These are feasts, they are to be proclaimed as holy or sacred convocations or holy or sacred assemblies. Now that's very, very strong language coming from the Lord. You've got to remember, Moses is penning it, but the Lord is speaking to him and having him write it down. Now Hebrew clearly states that these are Moadi Yehovah. That's Hebrew. And I do have a kind of a rule, if I do repeat, if I do say Hebrew, something in Hebrew, I do expect you to repeat it, unless it's a whole sentence, and you don't have to keep repeating it every time I say it, if I say the same word over again. But it's Moadi Yehovah. That translates into Feasts of the Lord. Now, the original Hebrew, or I should say in the original Hebrew, the word that is actually used, if you're reading Hebrew in context, is moadi, instead of the shortened version, which is moed, which you will read as a translation from, uh, from King James English in the Strong's Concordance, or in the Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon, or some of the other concordances or lexicons. They abbreviate it, they say moed. Now, well, moed is fine, moed means feast. But when you put the E on the end, Moadi, it makes it personal, first person personal. And who's speaking? It's obviously God speaking through Moses. By using Moadi, this word feast, uh, feast uh, or 
or the phrases appointed seasons or the phrase appointed times, it, it adds the possession to the noun and the feast then translates into my feast. This is not Moses speaking. This is the Lord. So whose feasts are they? They are the Lord's feast. They're not the Jewish feast. They're not the Old Testament feast. They are the feasts of the Lord. Moses tells the children of Israel this four different times in Leviticus 23 during these fall feasts. He also said it all over again for the fall fall feasts. So he actually says it nine times. These are feasts of the Lord. They're not the Jewish feasts. These are not Moses' words. I want to reiterate that. They're God's words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John 1, and God is speaking here. In addition, the Hebrew states it this way in context. It says, Mikra'e kadosh elechem moadi. Now, the word that, that I want to emphasize, two words that I just used in here, after we say Mikra'e kodesh, they're holy convocations, it says Elech, and it says the word Chem, together. Both of these words mean exactly the same thing. They mean these. Now, obviously, God is not saying through Moses, these, these feasts are holy. He's saying something different. By using both the words and adding Chem, Elech, and Chem, after the word I should say, after the, the Holy Convocations, he says, Elechem, putting these two Hebrew words together, having the exact same meaning, it puts an unequivocal emphasis on the statement. These holy assemblies, and they are emphatically special times or special appointed times for the Lord. You see, Hebrew is much stronger than any other English translation. Additionally, you have to understand that every single Hebrew word has a three-letter root, sometimes a two-letter root. So let's look at the root word for moed or moedi. In this particular case, it is a two-letter root word, ed. Now, I can't show you uh, the, the Hebrew word letters here because the camera's on me so let's just say it's a it's a it's a you're dead but anyway what it means Dalit I should say what it means is witness so the root word for the word Moadi or Moed the Lord's feast or feast is witness now since the feast have excuse me, the spring feasts have all been fulfilled during Yeshua, Jesus' first incarnation, we must be witnesses to that fact to the entire world. And I thank you that we have the whole world watching us today, or at least representatives from many, many different countries. Since the feasts are unequivocally special to the Lord, we should observe these feasts. Now, I'm not saying you should observe them according to rabbinical tradition. But I'm saying they should be observed. And they should be observed, observed as a witness to the prophetic fulfillment of Yeshua, of Jesus' incarnation as the Miach, Mashiach ben Yosef, which means Messiah or the Christ, the humble servant. Now, when he returns... He will come as the Messiah, or the Christ, the conquering king. But he came the first time, he came as a servant. Now, you might say, well, I'm not an Israelite. The Old Testament was written for the Jews. Or I'm a Christian. And I know that some churches and some church denominations teach that the Old Testament is not for you or us, if you're a part of that, or that the Old Testament is for the Jews, or that the Old Testament God was a vengeful God and the New Testament God is a loving God. And there are three scriptures in the Bible, two in the Old, one in, actually one in the Old, two in the New, that says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
It's the same God, and I taught about that this past Saturday. Uh, so look up this past Saturday's teaching. Uh, you'll find it extremely, extremely interesting and, and fulfilling. Jesus did fulfill the Old Testament, some of them say. Well, if you were not born of a Jewish parent or two, two Jewish parents or one, it doesn't make a difference, you've been grafted into the olive tree. You see, the Jewish people is a metaphor, uh, and we find it in, uh, in uh, or, or I should say the word Jew is a metaphor for the Israelites. And we find in, in Romans eleven seventeen we find this verse. This is the ESV version I'm reading. I'm reading. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. And the Bible, your Bible, was a Jewish book. Both the Old and the New Testament writers were all Jewish. The prophets were all Jewish. Mary and Joseph were Jewish. And yes, Jesus is Jewish. I know that shocks some people because I know that some uh, missionaries over the last several hundred years have taught that the church replaced the Jews. Well, if the church replaced the Jews, what book are they using? Because everything in the book is Jewish and everybody who wrote it is Jewish and Jesus is Jewish. You see, God called the Israelites, the modern term which is used, is Jews. They're one and the same. They're his chosen people. We find that in Deuteronomy 6, 7, excuse me, 7, 6, 14, 2. We find it again in 1 Kings 3, 8. We find it in Psalms 32, 12, 89, 19, 105, 43, Isaiah 43, 20, and many other places in Scripture. They're called, we are called, and I am a Jewish believer, we're called his chosen people. We're also called the apple of his eye. That's also found in Deuteronomy 32.10, Psalm 17.6, Proverbs 7.2, Lamentations 2.18, and Zechariah 2.8. So you're finding it in the Bible that you read, unless somebody has changed the words. And that is true for two denominations that are considered Christians, but I'm not going to get there today. You see, the words Jew and Israelite describe the exact same people. The word Jewish is a colloquialism used to describe the children of Israel or the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, through Jacob during the Roman occupation of Jerusalem and their surrounding territories. Now, don't misunderstand me. The value of keeping such biblical practices as the feasts of the Lord is perhaps best understood by Saul Paul's last statement in Colossians 2.17. And it reads, These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in who? Christ, the Messiah. These are a shadow of things to come. This means that the feasts were prophetic to Paul, and they are reality to us as they have been fulfilled. At least the spring feast. The fall feast have yet to be fulfilled. And I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel, Rosa Sharon, MN, and you can see how I believe Yeshua, Jesus, is going to fulfill the fall feast when he returns. Now, most Christian pastors teach that according to Matthew 5.17, Jesus abolished the law. This is incorrect. I'm not going to get into a detail, but let me point out a couple of things to you. Let's look at the scripture. He says in the King James Version, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. That's usually where they stop. But it continues. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, of course, some pastors say, well, he fulfilled. Not quite. Notice the law is linked to the prophets in that verse. Let me repeat it. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Again, the King James Version. So also keep in mind that there is no direct translation in Greek 
from which the the uh, Latin Vulgate was made and from which the English Bibles were made. So there is no direct direct translation for Torah, which means instruction, not law, into the Greek. But let's look at the verses that follow that verse. We read, and in, in, in this is Jesus' own words, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And he only fulfilled the spring feast. In other words, he's coming back and he's going to fulfill all prophecy. But right now, there's, there's prophecy that has not been fulfilled. And as long as we're talking about the feast, we're talking about the four spring uh, fall feasts which have not been fulfilled. And then he goes on to say, he says, so whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5, verses 18 and 19. The verse we read before was verse 17. However, let's look at the verses that follow, and these are Jesus' words. He says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now I want you to understand, the word Torah is instruction, not law. Now, he did abolish all of the instructions or guidances concerning sin sacrifice, but there are some issues that we have to deal with, and I'm going to deal with uh, how, do, how, how do we get forgiveness in the next video that I'm going to be doing. But let me go on to this one. Let me read verse 21. So I'm going to say to you, I'm going to read verse 20 again. For I say unto you, and except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye and you know what's interesting? is I don't ever recall more than two pastors in my over 30 years of going to churches since I became a believer that actually even read or talked about that verse. But what's verse 21 say? He says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. This is Matthew 5.21. But listen or read what comes. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, which means you or worthless one, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, though, though fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This is Matthew 5, 22. You see, Yeshua Jesus didn't abolish the law or complete it. He actually further refined these commandments. Look at the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 1 through 16, and Matthew 6 and 7. This is right in between those two. So Yeshua, Jesus didn't abolish the law, he refined it, but he will take care of it on his return. I find it interesting that these verses, as I just said, are actually placed between the Beatitudes and between the Sermon of the Mount, and yet most pastors never even read them. As I mentioned earlier, the feasts of the Lord are prophetic. The four spring feasts, as I also mentioned, have been fulfilled by Yeshua Jesus during his first coming. During his ministry, his death, his burial, and in his resurrection, he fulfilled all of the spring feasts that we find in Leviticus 23, verses 5 through 22, and in the book of Joshua, verses chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. I'll explain why I put that in there, or why I just mentioned it. But let me put this a little, a little differently. Okay, we should observe these feasts because the first two feasts, while historically representing the Israelites' exodus from slavery in Egypt, and I'm going to get into detail on that in the next couple videos, it also represents our exodus from, from our slavery to sin in our own lives. 
And the third feast reminds us that we too will be resurrected to everlasting life with our loving and passionate Savior, Savior who paid the ultimate price for our freedom from sin. And I'm going to repeat this because it is extremely important that you understand. We should observe these feasts because the first two feasts, which I'll get into, while historically representing the Israelites' exodus from slavery in Egypt, it also represents our exodus from slavery to sin in our own lives. And then, of course, the third feast reminds us that we, too, will be resurrected to everlasting life with our loving, passionate Savior who paid the ultimate price for our freedom from sin. But then there's the fourth, the, fourth, uh, the fourth feast, which I'll get into. You see, he sent his Holy Spirit, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And that reads as follows. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and uh, brought them out of the land of Egypt. For as much as they broke my covenant, although I was a Lord over them, saith the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And I will put my law, my constructions in their inner parts and in their hearts. I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them until the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their inequity, and their sin will I remember no more. This is the JPS version, 1917. He sent the Holy Spirit, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. And because even if you're not born Jewish to Jewish parents, you are grafted in, Romans 11. So what are the four spring feasts of the Lord? They're Passover, the feast of Passover. They're the feast of unleavened bread. It's the feast of first fruits and the feast of weeks. Now, the first of the spring feasts of the Lord is, as I just mentioned, Passover. In Hebrew, for those of you that want to repeat the Hebrew, it's Pesach. That's where we get Passover in English. Now, we find it in Leviticus 23.5, and it says, In the first month, Nisan, on the 14th day of the month, at dusk, is the Lord's Passover. Now, this year, it begins on Friday evening, because all biblical holidays start at sunset. That's March 30th, and of course, all day on Saturday, March 31st. That is the first spring feast. Now what's interesting is that the there's only been one, I think I'm going to cover this later, there's only been one sacrifice on that feast, for that feast. And that was in Egypt. And then there was another. Yeshua Jesus. There were no requirements on Passover in Scripture for a sacrifice after that. Now, let's talk about the second spring feast in the Lord. That one is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, what's interesting is, in rabbinical Judaism, they combine the two feasts, the Feast of Passover, the one-day feast, and the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread into one, and they call it Passover, an eight-day feast. But they use a different Hebrew word than Moed. They use the word Chag. Unfortunately, only the rabbis really understand what it is, what, what the difference is. And they're not going to tell you. In the English Bibles, well, unless you read and see when you, when you read the word feast of Passover, it's usually going to be connected with the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. So you have to differentiate or you have to be uh, a little Berean and understand that. All right, so let's talk about the feast of unleavened bread. In Hebrew, it's moed ha matzah. I'll repeat that for those of you that are repeating me. Moed, meaning feast. Ha, of, matzah, unleavened bread. We find that in Leviticus 23, 6, 
On the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread. Of course, that starts the day after Passover at sunset. So it starts on uh, it starts on Saturday, uh, March thirty first at sunset, and runs all the way through April seventh this year. Now the third spring feast of the Lord is the Feast of First Fruits. In Hebrew, it's Moed Habikurim, the Feast of First Fruits. We find that in Leviticus 23.10. And it said, and it reads, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are come into the land which I give unto you, ye shall reap a harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. Again, I'm still, I'm, I'm taking all this out of the, Jewish Publication Society of 1917, except this verse I'm going to talk to you right now, because we don't know when they come into the land. you got to remember that Moses is penning this when they're in the wilderness. They haven't entered the land yet, and Moses wasn't allowed to enter into the land. So we need to go to the book of Joshua to find out when they enter the land, so we know when the Feast of First Fruits biblically occurs. And we find that in Joshua 5, verses 10 and 11. It gives us the exact time of the, of the year, of the feast. It says, and I'm using the ESV version here, while the people of Israel were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and the manna ceased the day after. No more manna. So now we know when. It was the day after Passover is now the Feast of First Fruits. Leviticus 23.11 says, And he shall wave a sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave. Now the Sabbath day is Saturday. Now Sunday, I know a lot of churches, especially Catholicism, call Sunday a Sabbath. But if you actually look at the uh, the Catholic Ten Commandments, they've changed the Fourth Commandment from Sabbath to Lord's Day. Now, the Lord's Day is a very, very important day. It's in a commemoration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And the early church celebrated it every single Sunday, but now we only celebrate it once a year on what we call Easter Sunday. I'm not going to get into the, into the roots of that holiday, but uh, let, suffice it to say, uh, the Catholic Church changed the fourth commandment from observe the, Sa the Sabbath day to the fourth day, which is the Lord's day, and we should observe the Lord's day too in commemoration of the resurrection of our, of our uh, Lord and Savior. And that's why in the United States we only have a five-day work week, because we have the, they have the Lord's Sabbath on Saturday, and then of course we have the Lord's day on Sunday, so we have a five-day work week. Some people have to work those days. But anyway. Uh, continuing, this is the first day of the week following the Passover or following the Sabbath. This year, it actually appears or happens on April 1st because Passover is the 30th and the 31st. Uh-oh, there's my computer wanting to do something. I do not want it to do that. Sorry. Change it. All right, so... Let me get back on my train of thought because the computer wanted to restart and I just told it not to. Uh, so Passover this year is on Friday and Friday night and Saturday. So the, the day after the Sabbath would be Sunday, which would be April 1st. And guess what? That's Easter Sunday. Yes. Easter and the Feast of First Fruits always falls on the same day, except in a leap year. A Jewish leap year, that is. And I already explained that. We had, oh, I didn't say that. Uh, I just said the month of Adar. And we have Adar 1, and in, in the leap year, we have Adar 2. So we have two months with the same name, a 1 and a 2, and that actually moves uh, Easter back an extra month. Or I should say, well, it moves Passover back an extra month, so Easter comes early those, those years. At any rate, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 19 through 21. I'm going to use the King James Version here. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men 
must be miserable. But now in Christ, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. In verses 20 and 20, 21, excuse me, 22 and 23 of verse of First Corinthians 15, it says, "For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits; afterwards, they that are Christ at His coming." Rabbinical Judaism has actually changed when the feast of first fruits occurs. You, if you have any Jewish friends, you know, this might be a talking point for you to talk to them about. See, in doing so, the Feast of First Fruits in Rabbinical Judaism occurs one week later in order to hide the realization that Jews, or from Jews, that Yeshua, that Jesus, was and is the Messiah, the risen Messiah. The rabbis have done this because only the most orthodox or rabbinically trained Jews actually understand the difference between the two different words I mentioned earlier, moed and chag in Hebrew, which are both translated into the English word in the English Bibles as feasts, where actually one of them really means celebration. Chag means celebration. So, and feast or moadi refers to the Lord's appointed seasons, so English, read, English readers of the Bible have the same amount of difficulty as Christian readers do because they don't really understand or don't know the Hebrew and they don't see a distinction. So let's talk about the fourth feast. The fourth feast of the Lord, of the appointed seasons of the Lord. This feast is called the Feast of Weeks. The Hebrew is Shavuot. For those of you that are repeating, it's Shavuot. When you speak Hebrew, the, the, access, the accent is always on the last syllable, unless I say otherwise, and unless I mispronounce it. You see, this feast occurs seven weeks after the Feast of First Fruits. So in Greek, we use the, we use the word 50, or the Greek word for 50, which is Pentecost. So the Feast of Weeks in Hebrew is Shavuot, and in Greek is Pentecost. In Hebrew, it's Moed Ha Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, or as we already said, Pentecost, found in Leviticus 23 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, that means the day after, after the day of rest, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the weave or the wave offering, that's the Feast of First Fruits, seven weeks shall there be complete. This is the JPS again. So I'll read it again. And ye shall count unto, the for, uh, unto you from the morrow, after the day of rest, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the waving, seven weeks shall there be complete. In other words, seven weeks. Leviticus 16 says, And even unto morrow, after seven week, shall the number of fifty days and ye shall present a new meal offering unto the Lord. So that's what we get, 50, and that's what we get, Pentecost. This year it's May 20th, Sunday. Interesting. That's also Pentecost. It doesn't always match because, it matches this year because the Feast of Passover is at the end of the week, so there's no days between the two, and so uh, it's all it's on the exact same day. Sometimes it's off by a, by a week. So let's review. Jesus fulfilled all the spring feasts of the Lord on his first coming. He was the Passover lamb. He was the sacrifice. Remember, I said earlier there was only one sacrifice ever required in Scripture on Passover. That was the one in Egypt. Then there's the second one. That's Yeshua. That's Jesus. There are no sacrifices on the Feast of Passover. All of the sacrifices, biblically and scripturally, that we read in the, in the Bible, if we had a sacrificial system, occur off for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the seven-day feast following Passover. Now, I've, had, I've heard, actually, pastors, messianic pastors mostly, 
preaching that Jesus came early, otherwise he couldn't have been sacrificed at the right time. No, 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 no. He was the second and the only one of the only two sacrifices that were required on Passover. All other sacrifices are required for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the feast, the seven-day feast that follows Passover. Now, he also fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread because he was sinless. And he was the first fruits of the resurrection, as I read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. And he sent his Holy Spirit, his helper, on Shavuot, or Pentecost. And we find this in John 14, 6 and 26, John 15, 26, and 16, 7, and in Acts 2, obviously, Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. Now this concludes this teaching on the introduction to the spring feast and the spring feast of the Lord. In the coming days and weeks, I will be adding additional videos about these feasts. These are some, uh, these are some very important, or I should say there are some very important instructions attached to the end of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. So don't miss part two of the Feast of Shavuot because that is extremely interesting because the instructions that God tells Moses to put at the very end of that actually would actually resulted in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior. So at any rate, don't miss part two of the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Shavuot. Uh, and that's going to be sometime in May because I'm going to I'm going to hold off on doing that because Pentecost is May 20th. So we tell you to have a blessed day. I want to thank you all for being here. You can watch this video over and over again. It's one of the shorter videos. It only took 45 minutes. Shalom and stay prepared because we do not know the day or the hour. Only the Father knows. Bashem Yeshua Mishachenu. Blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Shalom.